Order members, welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response. Item 1 on the agenda, minutes of proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 21st of May. Members are asked to note these minutes uh, which have been agreed. The minutes from that meeting have been published in the official report and is available on the committee page on the website. Item number two is the statement from the Minister for the Economy. The Speaker received notification on the 9th of June that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pact. I'd like to welcome the Minister uh, for the Economy to this meeting of the Committee. But before the Minister makes her statement, I remind members that following it there will be an opportunity to ask questions, not to make speeches. Members who ask short, sharp, focused questions will be invited to ask the supplementary question if they wish. Members who engage in preambles, however, they may find that uh, they don't get to put the question or uh, at least a supplementary. I ask members for their cooperation and will, of course, be expecting the Minister also to give succinct answers so that everyone will be afforded an opportunity to ask their questions. I invite the Minister to make her statement, which should be heard without interruption. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And thank you for the opportunity once again to address the committee. Um, members, no one needs reminded of the devastation that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused to our economy. Only this morning we have had very regrettable news of 600 redundancies at Bombardier. My thoughts are with the people directly affected and their families. As members will appreciate, this was a commercial decision reflecting the global market conditions as a direct result of COVID-19. My department's career service is available to support those impacted by offering free, professional, impartial career information. This is advice and guidance tailored to individual needs and designed to help people to explore future training and employment opportunities. I and my officials in the department and in Invest NI have been in constant contact <clears throat> over the past few months with firms such as Thomson Aerospace and Bombardier. I have raised my concerns about the impact of COVID-19 on the aerospace sector with the Bayes Minister, Minister Zohawi in London over the past number of weeks and expressed the urgent need for a national strategy to support the sector. Locally, I have asked Invest NI to convene a group of parties involved in the wider aerospace sector to consider what additional support they require and what governments at national and devolved level can do to help them through this very turbulent period. I fear that this will not be the last day we have bad news on the economy. Thousands of businesses have uh, temporarily shut their doors. Our tourism industry has been put into deep freeze and it is estimated the jobs of over 200,000 people in Northern Ireland have been furloughed as a result of COVID-19. This represents nearly a quarter of workers here having been furloughed and almost three quarters of the self-employed having to avail of the, the support scheme open to them. From these most difficult of circumstances, Northern Ireland has responded and adapted. Essential businesses modified their premises and introduced strict hygiene practices to enable us to continue buying vital items like food and other supplies. Frontline workers played a very important role. We have adopted social distancing rules, limited our contact with others, college and university students moved to online learning, and many people have been working from home. Everyone has sacrificed a lot and given a lot of themselves to enable us to live alongside this virus while it's here. I want to say thank you for everything people have done. Government has also stepped up. So far, we have paid out 300 million in support grants to thousands of businesses. These grants have protected jobs, 
prevented business closures and provided vital temporary support. A rates holiday was agreed and then extended to help businesses survive into the future. The UK's government uh, job retention scheme took the unprecedented step of paying 80% of people's salaries up to 2,500 a month. All of the hard work of the last few months mean we have reached a point where we can now focus on the recovery phase and the rebuilding of the Northern Ireland economy. We need to take action now to rebuild a more competitive, inclusive and greener economy. We will have the safety of people at the heart of everything we do. The hard days are not over, but we are taking steps forward and it is time for the pace to accelerate. At the end of May, I published an outline for economic recovery. Charting a course for the economy, our first steps, was the first in a series of publications by my department, <coughs> excuse me, looking at how to move forward from the economic damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Other important issues, including childcare, public transport, and the management of footfall in city centre streets need to be considered alongside our work. We are working now to extend confidence in the construction and manufacturing sectors, continuing to move out of lockdown while staying safe and working safe. Many firms have adapted their working practices and protocols or are preparing to do so, particularly in the wider manufacturing and food production sectors. All employers need to ensure their workplaces are safe. This may include increased cleaning of premises, adding perspect walkways, splitting work patterns, or having appropriate PPE. The Engagement Forum has published workplace safety guidance for employers, employees, and the self-employed. The Tourism Recovery Steering Group, which I chair, has been engaging with stakeholders to plan for a new future for tourism here. We received a boost last week when it was agreed that hotels, caravan sites, guest houses and B&Bs could reopen on the 20th of July. This is conditional on the transmission rate remaining low. Tourism won't be the same as before, but I'm very optimistic about what is to come. I was pleased to be at Debenhams this week for the reopening of their store. I was also delighted I was able to make an internet star of Shirley Roberts, who was caught moonwalking in the background of the interview. And from tomorrow, all good retailers can also open again, as long as they adhere to the necessary safety measures and there is no increase in the spread of the virus. It is hoped that further announcements can come soon on dates for the reopening of the service providers and the hospitality sector. I have written to the Health Minister to ask for a review of the physical distancing advice to stay two metres from other people. This needs to be debated and people need to recognise the positive impact moving to the World Health Organisation recommended one metre would have on various sectors across our economy and education sectors. I would stress that people who can work at home should continue to do so. Unfortunately, government grants, home working and reopening in some sectors cannot protect all businesses or all jobs. I have said many times before, each month of shutdown has been akin to a large recession and we know the impact of the virus will be long lasting in homes right across Northern Ireland. This will have a knock on effect on people's mental health, their physical health and their family life. The claimants count rose by almost 90% in April and unemployment increased uh, by over 26,000 to 56,200. Six years of labour market progress was lost in one single month. We need to look out for each other and going forward, we must protect the vulnerable. Restarting the economy safely, as we are doing, allows people to get back to work. We also need to address the persistently high levels of economic activity in Northern Ireland. For those who have lost their jobs, we want to give them the opportunity to seek new employment elsewhere. Turning to the area of skills, which has been a priority for me since I took up office, 
recognising that skills will play a key role in our economic uh, recovery. I have supported thousands of learners uh, across the system from further education, higher education, apprentices and trainees, as well as a great many others engaged in skills. There have been real challenges that we have been working through, from protecting the skills infrastructure so that it will be there to play its place in recovery, to the very practical issues of supporting learners to adjust to a new way of learning. This is particularly important to those participants who are the most vulnerable in society, ensuring that their studies are completed and their qualifications gained. We know already some of the future challenges we might face. Studies suggest that 16 to 24 year olds are particularly vulnerable, for example, apprentices. And that is why we are developing initiatives to help sustain apprenticeships and support the apprenticeship pipeline for new apprentices. In the longer term, we want to make sure we have a system that promotes upskilling and reskilling to allow individuals to move into areas where there is greater demand. As Minister for the Economy, I want to support individuals in their journey and ensure that they are equipped to avail of new opportunities. Just this week, I approved an investment of 1.7 million to support 2,000 online accredited courses. We will focus on sectors that can deliver high paying jobs. This is likely to be within big data, health and life sciences, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, materials and engineering. There are different phases. This is a long-term aspiration and requires a change in the skills base. Currently, disproportionate uh, numbers with low or no skills are in the labour market. Our initial objective is to stabilise the labour market and ensure we retain as many jobs as possible. We will be developing our new 10-year plan for skills. City and growth deals also have a significant part to play in supporting sustained sub-regional growth with capital investment of nearly 1.5 billion from the public and private sector. I remain committed to continuing the excellent collaboration and partnership work to date with councils and their delivery partners to deliver the city and growth deal programme across Northern Ireland. The reconstituted economic advisory group chaired by Alvina Graham, will help us to plan ahead. I will be unveiling the full membership of that group and the work they will be engaged in next week. People in Northern Ireland are resilient and innovative. I have no doubt that we will rebuild and redesign our economy, and we can all help in that recovery. I would encourage everyone to consider a holiday at home this year when the time is right. Please also support our local businesses, hotels and retailers as they reopen. This will help us to rebuild from the inside and will put strength in our core. As we plan for the future, everyone must continue to work safe and stay safe. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Minister. And we will now have a period of about one hour for questions to the Minister. Again, I remind uh, members to, that they should be concise in their question. It is not an opportunity to make speeches. And I would encourage the Minister also to be uh, concise in her answers to those focused questions. And that way members will be afforded supplementaries and every member will be allowed to ask them. And I invite the Chair of the Committee for the Economy, Kiva Archibald, to ask the first question. And as is normal, the Chair will be given more latitude. Um, and um, I thank the Minister for his statement here today um, and I'd like to send my solidarity to the workers um, at Bombardier and Thompson and elsewhere who have lost their jobs this week and to their families also. Um, it's a big blow to our local economy. I know from speaking to union reps this morning they're emphasising it's not just the loss of those jobs and those com companies, it's also the impact on our, our local supply chains. So in terms of planning for the economic recovery, is the Minister looking at how to support strategic important sectors to our local economy as well as expanding others um, and making the case to the, the British government for economic stimulus, stimulus in respect of that. And of course there would need to be some conditionality in terms of any intervention that's going to companies in respect of meeting targets like decarbonisation and um, upholding workers' rights as well. 
Um, can I thank the Chair for her uh, question and for her continuing cooperation uh, on these very, very important measures. Um, we need to reopen our economy. We need to be reopened for businesses. And that, I think, will uh, need two phases uh, to what we do. The first phase will be trying to reopen and to work with the, the impacts that COVID-19 has had on our economy. And we have seen that very dramatically with the job losses in the aerospace sector at Thompson's and at uh, Bombardier and the potential uh, for the fragility of that supply chain into those very big companies to be impacted by it. The next phase will be about rebuilding, reinventing, um, making sure that we have an economy for Northern Ireland that is fit uh, for the next uh, uh, phase uh, of its uh, development uh, and indeed for the next century of Northern Ireland. Um, I um, will be pretty positive that we will continue to support and work with those sectors that are the staples of our economy. So agri-food, tourism, manufacturing, the service sectors. Northern Ireland is a very, very large service economy. So those will all be the staples of our economy. But I also want us to look at those areas where we can bring in new and additional benefit to our economy. So we've already a, a reputation uh, as being world class in our cybersecurity uh, area. So I want to build on that. I want to build on the green economy. And I want to work alongside our universities um, where we can um, use their innovation, their research, their knowledge to actually try to help us boost the economy and grow it so that we're not just getting jobs, we're getting better jobs and we're retaining our young people here in Northern Ireland and giving them prospects for the future. I call Kay Varchival for supplementary. Um, go Margaret, and I thank the Minister for, for her response. Um, Minister, it was, it was um, reported in today's Irish News that there has been some undersubscription to the, the hardship fund um, and maybe an underspend in, in terms of that. And I was just wondering, um, will you be looking there for to, to redirect uh, that towards additional support to, to other businesses who've been missed out so far? Go Margaret. Thank you. Um, we are, are currently, um, the Hardship Fund will close uh, tomorrow um, and uh, using this public platform I'd appeal for anybody who thinks that they may el be eligible to check that criteria and get the application in. Um, we will be looking then at uh, the applications and how that, that rolls out. Um, and then um, we will be assessing if there is a, an underspend in relation to that. Um, any underspend in relation to these uh, funds is ring-fenced. It will go back into the centre and it will then be for the executive and the finance minister to say how much is being made available for further help to businesses. Um, as soon as that process has concluded, um, I will be very help happy uh, to identify other areas of the economy uh, to uh, the executive and the finance minister where help uh, would be needed. I call Gary Middleton. Thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thanks, Minister. Uh, Minister, there's been discussions recently around social distancing and moving from two metres to one metre. Uh, the WHO points to one metre. Uh, how would that uh, help uh, the local economy in, in rebuilding? Um, there has indeed uh, been much discussion uh, around this, and I thank the member for bringing this up. This is really key to the reopening and development uh, of our economy. And before I um, go any further in all of this, in everything we do, we must make sure that we are acting safely in the best interests of protecting lives and in line with the scientific and medical advice. However, if we are going to open up our economy and open up our schools and create capacity, then we will have to have an open and honest discussion with ourselves about uh, this issue of two metres uh, versus one metre. In many countries uh, across Europe, one metre has already been adopted. It is the World Health Organization standard. So in many Scandinavian countries, in France and other areas, one metre is now the, the standard 
uh, accepted rule in other countries like ourselves, Republic of Ireland, and I think in the US, although looking at some pictures from there, there's not a lot of social distancing. Um, um, there has been uh, still the desire to keep the two metre rule. If we're thinking about this in terms of businesses or schools, um, people who own restaurants tell me that at two metres um, they are running at about 30% capacity and at one metre they will be running at 75-80% capacity. That gives them a decent chance of survival. So this is something that we as an assembly, that the executive will have to have that open and honest discussion about. I have thrown it out. I have been honest as the economy minister and said, this is what we need to do to get our economy up and running. But the, it must be in line with the transmission rate of the virus and where um, the chief medical officer and chief uh, scientific officer tell us it's safe. I call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, some of the hospitality groups have suggested using open air spaces uh, or outdoor spaces to manage social distancing. Is that something that you would be supportive of? Um, yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, of course I would. Um, as we move uh, to open up uh, our hospitality sector, um, and I have been doing an increasing amount of work uh, with the hospitality sector um, in the last uh, number of months. They, in March, had to close down. That was it. That's an enormous sacrifice that the hospitality sector has made um, during this really extraordinary times that we have. So we need to work with them to make sure that they can get back on track. And while we will always have to, and I, I can't see that we won't have social distancing and the need for good hand hygiene, the need for good hygiene in restaurants, shops, etc., etc., I think that to help them to utilize uh, their space, then there is an argument for allowing people to use outdoor space as part of that. Now, I have written to the Department of Communities and the Department of Infrastructure because, as I was saying to the executive when we were talking about this issue um, just earlier, if you've been a local councillor, you'll know how absolutely complex and complicated this whole area is. Seems simple, but it has impacts for re uh, licensing, it has impacts for planning, um, and of course it has impacts for people who have disabilities if we um, are going for something that akin to the, the, the cafe pavement culture that we might look at. Um, so yes, I think it will help with the viability um, of the hospitality sector. Uh, I think it's something uh, that we should absolutely look at, but I think that we need a little bit of work in-house to make sure that we can do it successfully with infrastructure and communities. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And I'm glad you got through that statement today without any interruptions, either before you or behind you. So, <laughs> um, can, can I ask, the, U, the UK has... Oh, traditionally been particularly bad at dealing with insolvency. Uh, in the US, about 25% per of businesses that are insolvent are actually rescued. This is way below 10%. Can the minister give a commitment to help and support businesses, particularly the SMEs that are facing insolvency, that they will to be protected and, and rescued at to the best of her department's ability? Yes, uh, can I thank the member for her question? I think that this is a very important area of work. Um, and we have, as you will know, recently passed a legislative consent motion um, so that uh, we are giving consent to those elements of the insolvency bill uh, that is currently in the House um, that, so that we have already given consent to that. That should help us and help uh, firms to stay on track for a little bit longer um, and be fair uh, to creditors and ensure uh, that we have a fair process uh, in relation to insolvency. I think it would be regrettable and very, very difficult to explain uh, for firms who are suffering uh, from cash flow problems uh, out of the COVID-19 crisis if there were not uh, these mitigation measures in place. And I do thank the House uh, 
uh, for the support for the legislative consent motion uh, and these will uh, be in place originally designed many of them to be in place until June uh, but uh, those can roll forward uh, making sure um, that, that we are dealing with a very crucial area of business. I call Sinead McLaughlin for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, many industry, industry bodies and representative bodies have spoken to us uh, at the committee, uh, uh, and it has been a, a recurrent theme um, that the, the support of Invest NI is particularly towards large businesses. I think in the, the current circumstances, Invest NI need to concentrate on SMEs if we are to help support the recovery uh, and prevent insolvency in some of the sector. Um, can I, 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 I will reply to that because I do think that this is very important. Northern Ireland is a, a small business economy, so it is very, very important that we're taking steps to support small business. Um, and that's why the access to finance, the job furlough scheme, uh, the self employed all of those measures are really, really vital in, in trying to get us through uh, the current situation. Um, I've been talking to business on a very, very regular basis. Um, and they indicate that without these extraordinary interventions from government, uh, they would have not uh, have really stood a chance. I think now that the best thing that we can do is to try to reopen our economy safely, sensibly, in a staged manner. I've been trying to do that. Um, I'm glad that we have dates for hotels. I'll be bringing forward uh, more papers next week on uh, the tourism sector focusing on how we can get uh, an early recovery and maybe make something out of what's left of the home market in the summer season um, and uh, the opening up uh, of retail. Um, and the executive today agreed that all retail across the board, including shopping centres, um, should open. So I think that these are important steps, but we will also need to work with manufacturing uh, and with construction to ensure that we have a holistic approach. Thank you. Call John Stewart. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statements thus far, and can I join her in her um, sending our um, best wishes and thoughts to the families of those who have lost their job potentially at Bombardier. I do fear it could be a lot more if we do not have a robust recovery strategy in place, and hopefully the government can do all it can to intervene. Can I thank you for your intervention and your work so far to get retail back open? Hospitality looks like it's coming back, and we await big announcements today on that. Can we have a question? Date in place. And one of the sectors that has not had any support or any guidance or clarity so far is the health and beauty sector. Our salons, our hairdressers, our barbers provide a vital support to the town centre. Can you do anything, Minister, to outline a, um, a pathway for that and give them clarity on what guidance and safety measures? they can put in place ahead of reopening. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. Um, I, along with many others, would give anything to have uh, the, the hairdressers back open again. Um, I think it's, it's been one of the, the trials uh, of life. Um, yes, you make an important point. Um, we need to get not just general retail open again, our food sectors functioning well, our non-food uh, retail open and functioning well, uh, but we need to get that service bit of the economy uh, working again as well. Um, as you know, in all of the plans that we have had throughout the British Isles, this is a sector because of the very nature of the work they do that has been a little later uh, in uh, everyone's plan. Um, and this is certainly the next uh, piece in the jigsaw to get our town centres revitalised and get a sense of normality back for people um, who have found it very, very difficult. John Stewart for a brief supplementary. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, the Chair raised the issue of the um, Micro Hardship Fund. It does look like a significant amount will be returned. Could I ask you to maybe produce a spade ready or shovel ready strategy or um, package that could maybe be released should more money become available through the June monitoring round to help social enterprises and no sole traders who have to date missed out on everything? Thank you, Minister. Um, the issue of, of uh, the, the, the grants funding is slightly different to the June monitoring round um, in that it is ring-fenced COVID-specific funding. 
um, which will go back to the executive for the executive to make a further decision uh, on how that um, will look. I, of course, will prepare an options paper around that, including all of the options that you have indicated. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. We are all reacting to the devastating news of significant job losses at flagship manufacturer Bombardier that will affect hundreds of families in my constituency of East Belfast. Can I ask the Minister for the Economy what action she is taking to support the company to mitigate redundancies and to provide retraining and reemployment opportunities for highly skilled staff? Can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, and I understand uh, the significant um, distress uh, that today's announcement will cause, um, not just um, for Bombardier, but for the shockwaves that that will cause uh, within uh, the wider uh, manufacturing supply chain. Um, I do understand that very well. Um, over recent weeks, I've been down uh, to Bombardier to talk uh, to its chief executive. Um, as, as I have done with uh, the Thompson uh, Aerospace Group as, as well. Really, um, the issue uh, in terms of aerospace is a global issue. Um, it is a national issue as well as something that will disproportionately impact on us in Northern Ireland. If we think that Bombardier or that Boeing and Airbus have uh, reduced uh, their purchasing capacity by over 40%, we understand the, not just the short-term challenges, but the long-term challenges that there will be uh, for the aerospace industry. I hold uh, a weekly meeting uh, with Bayes, um, and in fact, last week had a uh, specific meeting with Minister Zahawi, Michael Ryan, and myself uh, to discuss the challenges, not just uh, of Bombardier, but of aerospace in general. And uh, if you look nationally at the redundancies in Rolls-Royce uh, and across the country in this sector, you will see just how difficult uh, this is. Although um, nationally, bears tell me that this is red flagged and a sector uh, that they uh, know will need intervention, I think that the government now needs to accelerate that intervention plan. Um, and I know that I will be doing everything I can uh, to uh, make sure that that happens. Locally, um, Invest in Northern Ireland uh, obviously um, have been talking uh, to both Thomson uh, and to Bombardier. Um, these are companies that are innovative, uh, research and development oriented, export oriented, um, and these are our client companies of Invest. And we will continue to work with them to see what we can do. Uh, to help them uh, to diversify. For Bombardier, um, the most important thing that they need to get done is to have uh, the deal with Spirit concluded um, and everything uh, back on track. Um, and in terms of the workforce, I, of course, will work with those uh, who have uh, um, received devastating news um, and those who will potentially be impacted. I understand that uh, the 90-day redundancy procedure will go into operation as of today. And as this progresses, then of course my department um, will organise uh, help uh, to those uh, who are impacted, both in terms uh, of uh, any other uh, employment uh, opportunities or retraining and upskilling. I call Chris Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her detailed answer. As she says, Bombardier COO Michael Rahn has called COVID-19 an existential crisis to the aerospace industry. Can I ask the Minister what specific support she has secured from the UK Government for our aerospace sector and what actions she has taken to advance a regional aviation and aerospace recovery strategy for Northern Ireland? As I have said uh, in my previous answer, um, this is something that needs to be taken forward at a national level. Um, and I am hopeful uh, that the Minister Zahawi will indeed uh, conduct this. And of course, I will continue my conversations with him to make sure that this happens. I hope to meet the broader sector next week because that sector itself 
uh, needs to identify where the opportunities are uh, and how we can sustain not just the larger um, aerospace companies, but the small manufacturing companies, some of whom I met earlier in the week, um, and uh, the part that they play in that supply chain uh, for the aerospace industry. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your statement thus far. Minister, caravan parks, when opening happening soon, will it just be for statics that are allowed to be occupied, or will touring vans be permitted if they are self-contained? Thank you uh, very much for that question, um, and I can understand coming from the Strangford constituency why that is of particular interest uh, to you. Um, I am hopeful. Um, we have already identified the, the 20th of July, um, but I would be hopeful that we would be able to bring that date forward, um, recognising that static caravans uh, and caravans uh, are self-contained units, as are other elements of the self-catering uh, holiday uh, accommodation uh, sphere in Northern Ireland. So for those that are uh, self-catering, self-contained, I would hope that we would be able uh, to bring a proposal, uh, and I certainly intend to bring a specific paper to the executive next week uh, specifically around that. Um, I am um, keen uh, that we allow people to return uh, to their caravans, whether they are touring vans or, or static vans. However, I do see that there is a, an issue uh, around uh, caravan park owners uh, and how common areas are treated, so um, shared facilities like showers, toilet blocks, etc. Et so um, I would suspect that when uh, we return to caravan parks, that it will be for those who own static caravans because they are self-contained, uh, and for those who can uh, plug into the amenities uh, on their pitch uh, for their, their touring caravan. I think that the, the medical advice shows us that the sharing of surfaces um, without um, really, really deep cleans in between is a, a pretty difficult thing uh, to manage. So that's where I see the sphere coming, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to announce something in that fairly soon. Thank you. I call Harry Harvey for supplementary. Thank you very much, and thank you, Minister. Um, you did mention 20th of July as the opening date, but would you be hopeful that maybe sooner than that? You did mention there possibly it could happen sooner. Thank you. The member is persistent <laughs> in his question uh, um, for his constituents. Um, I think that um, executive colleagues recognise um, that self-contained units are different to uh, hotels, restaurants, etc. So. I am keen to see the tourism, hospitality and that wider sector open up. Um, they have had an exceedingly difficult time. Um, they um, closed down in March of the back of that very long autumn-winter period uh, when it is much, much more difficult to operate uh, successfully financially, and now they have been closed for three months. I would really like to see them get something back of that summer period, and I know that communities in Northern Ireland will support them uh, in doing that. Um, so I am hopeful, um, but it, of course, is for uh, executive colleagues to decide, um, um, and uh, of course, on the advice of the chief medical officer and chief scientific officer. I call Declan McLear. Um, in these uh, difficult times, there are many employers who are struggling to hold on to their apprentices, uh, given the economic times we're in. Does the member have any um, consideration or ideas of how she can support employers and training providers uh, to hold on to present their apprentices at this time? Thank you. Can I thank uh, the member for that question? It's very, very timely. I have just um, looked at uh, the reprioritisation of funding uh, within uh, the Department of the Economy. And of course, um, the skills agenda, retaining skills and upskilling young people is really important to me um, as, as, as an issue. Um, in the last downturn, we know that 16 to 24 year olds were impacted disproportionately to any other part of the economy. And at one stage, we had um, unemployment in that particular sector 
uh, running uh, well above 25, 26, 27 percent. I do not want to see that happen again. So I've just taken some measures uh, within my department, and uh, we will be making announcements on these fairly soon, to target specifically apprentices, retaining apprenticeships, and supporting employers to retain those young people as they try to continue with their career path. Call Declan McAleer for supplementary. Um, I thank the, the Minister. I do believe she also has a answered my supplementary. I was, I, was, I was going to ask her about the possibility of introducing like, an, interim apprenticeship pro, uh, an interim apprenticeship programme. So, effectively, is that what you're talking about there, Minister, in, in your answer? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I am very concerned. Um, I don't want a lost generation of young people who go through uh, similar trials uh, and tribulations. And of course, I'm also really supportive um, of apprenticeships at all levels, right through to those higher level apprenticeships. And I have many conversations uh, with uh, the education sector uh, and indeed with the education minister saying that those higher level apprenticeships um, are a really important pathway for young people and that schools need to highlight them as alternatives to the traditional a-levels and, and uh, university route that many young people take. So the answer is yes. We're working on this uh, as a proposal. We've set aside some money for it, um, and uh, we'll see uh, how it works out. Thank you. Nicole Gordon Dunn. Deputy Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for coming here today. I think we all understand the massive impact on tourism that the, the COVID-19 has had and on Northern Ireland. But there are opportunities, and I'm sure, Minister, you would uh, take that opportunity now to highlight those opportunities in relation to holiday at home, staycations, um, promotion of our local tourist attractions, Can and, I have a and we, as we need to fill the empty bed spaces in our hotels and our BBs, B and Bs. Yes, um, I think that this is important. As I've said before, um, I. I think that the opportunity for our sector um, to, to make something of what's left of this summer season, and of course being Northern Ireland we don't get a long summer season, um, is uh, for that home market. So I have been talking uh, to Tourism NI um, around uh, some marketing um, and some publicity around this very, very specific issue. We obviously want to get the issues out of the way of opening and all of the challenges around that. So we want to get that sorted out and we want to have a, a marketing campaign aimed not just um, at the island of Ireland, but aimed at the wider British Isles um, so that we're looking to um, Scotland, England and Wales, uh, as well as the Republic of Ireland, uh, where we can target and market uh, what uh, tourists can do, see and enjoy in Northern Ireland. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister. Air connectivity is a huge issue as we try to attract tourists. And what uh, conversations have you had and what work have you done in relation to getting our three airports up and running and get the planes back in the air? Yes, can I thank the member? This is an absolutely essential uh, part of, of where uh, we need to go for both business, family life, um, and indeed the wider tourism sector. Air connectivity is absolutely essential. Um, we need to connect to our biggest market. So the rest of GB is that market, um, and we need to do that. We need also to connect to that market in a way that takes us to the regions within that market. So our connectivity to all parts of the United Kingdom uh, is extremely important. You will know that we work quite hard between finance, infrastructure and economy uh, to make sure that there was a package in place um, for our airports um, during the worst of the pandemic. I'm glad to say that um, in terms of that connectivity to London, Aer Lingus has certainly increased those number of flights very, very significantly. And my information is that BA will soon start uh, their flights again. 
Um, I last week uh, spent some time talking to the Chief Executive of Belfast City Airport um, to uh, ask him what further support was needed and how um, were they working to fill the routes um, that were left with the demise of Fly B. Um, and the good news uh, was that um, they are, are pretty confident that they will be able to uh, fill those routes once again um, and that uh, we will get back uh, to a much, much more uh, stable place in terms of our connectivity um, with uh, the rest uh, of the United Kingdom. Um, so um, it is a work in progress. We will need uh, to ensure perhaps that there is further support for those airports, um, and we are engaging with the Department of Transport to see uh, if uh, they can, of course, it is a national issue, um, and uh, if, if they can do that. And of course, we never fail to point out that connecting the regions of the United Kingdom is supposed to be a priority for this Conservative government. I call Sinead Innes. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and following on from my colleague Declan McAleer's question um, about the uh, apprenticeship, apprenticeship Recovery Initiative, um, ind industry uh, providers have suggested that the Department for Economy helps pay um, apprenticeship wages in the short term. Uh, will the Minister ensure that the Apprenticeship Recovery Strategy includes these proposals? As I say, um, we are working uh, on these proposals. We will bring forward them shortly. We have identified funding for them. Um, and uh, I see it as a huge priority. Um, by the way, we are not only working at apprenticeships proposals, but we want to make sure that we retain and stabilise that wider training sector. So it is really important for all of our young people, um, whether uh, they're doing an apprenticeship, whether they're part of Training for Success, that they have a pathway uh, for their own career. So to try to stabilise that sector, of course, we've continued to pay uh, those training providers, even while young people have not been operating within them. We have continued to pay young people all of their training allowances, um, so that we try to retain young people, give them purpose, direction, and pathways, and choices, and opportunities in life. Call Sinead Dennis for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her, her answer. Um, and I suppose, uh, again, piggybacking on another member's question, um, you said in your statement that tourism won't be the same um, as before, and I'm glad to hear that. And I'm wondering, has the Minister or the Tourism Steering Group considered the possibility um, of extending Ireland's ancient east um, to the two north easterly uh, counties of Ireland, um, uh, Down and, and Armagh, and the great e uh, economic benefits that would bring to our tourism product? We are, of course, always open uh, to looking at how we can extend the tourism product in Northern Ireland. Um, and if I can be um, specific to my own constituency, I uh, have been exploring how, of course, we can uh, do further work on the Game of Thrones uh, proposal that there is uh, for that uh, particular area. Um, I, the work of the tourism uh, steering group so far has been on trying to get the tourism industry and the hospitality industry up, running and open again. And that has been our focus. And then we will turn to the long-term challenges that we have, not just about what we uh, have in terms of product, but the marketing of that product. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, conducted a, a, a conversation um, by Zoom, the great thing that we, we're now all connecting with, um, with the, some tourism operators uh, in uh, North America. Um, and they were saying that uh, while they had cancelled many of their tours, many of those had been rebooked for 2021. So um, while uh, I recognise the real challenges and difficulties and, and the distress of some people within that sector at this minute in time, we will recover and we will come back, um, and we need to make sure that we have everything and the building blocks in place for it. Um, some of them were also talking um, about um, our, our um, golf offering, because of course a lot of uh, the Americans who come here want to come here um, and uh, play Royal Port Rush, Royal County Down, and all of the other courses uh, that are so amazing. Uh, and of course, we will be trying to uh, identify further opportunities uh, to enhance uh, that uh, golf offering and promote it across the world. 
I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, Game of Thrones tourism does not happen without an ecosystem of creative professionals and artists who are makeup artists, costume designers, technician, camera technicians, grips, video designers. Um, but our creative industries in Northern Ireland feel left behind, uh, I am afraid. Will she urgently work with the Communities Minister to develop a uh, long term strategy to revitalise and protect our arts? and cultural sectors in Northern Ireland, which is not just economically important, but socially and culturally critical to our whole island? Um, I think that um, sometimes people, I think, sort of try to figure out how quickly we will mention the creative industries in Northern Ireland, even Game of Thrones, uh, in a debate like this. But that's because it's really important. Um, it's really important uh, to individuals. It's really important to the success of Northern Ireland. And uh, some of the um, wonderful things that have been happening with the creative industries um, have showcased this um, part of the world uh, right across the world. And that's why we have tourists who come from the Far East, etc. So I absolutely recognise the importance of the creative industries uh, to Northern Ireland. And that is why um, I have been uh, working uh, with Northern Ireland Screen um, around how we support those industries going forward, how we open up those film projects again um, and get them back on track um, so that we can continue, um, not just for the creative industry's uh, sake, but for the wider economy, um, get uh, those elements of our economy back on track. And the member will know um, that even down at Belfast Harbour in the earlier, a few months ago, um, there was a, pro a project uh, to actually double the amount of space and investment uh, in the creative industries uh, in Belfast Harbour. These are important for their economy. But of course, they're also important for us as a people. Um, and uh, I um, have no problem. The Minister for Communities has uh, more responsibility for the individual uh, arts projects than I do. My element of it is tourism and how this impacts on the economy. Um, and I see a great future ahead. I call Matthew O'Toole for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. But I think it's really important to say you've mentioned some of the big ticket um, uh, creative industries and the big productions happening. They're great. We want those to continue. But this is about joining that up and protecting our small scale arts and cultural sectors. So it, it would be good if you could commit to that. And very briefly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, would you join with me in asking the BBC to clarify the position of the £77 million investment they are supposed to be making in my constituency, um, in, in inner south Belfast. They are supposed to be investing £77 million in a new digital hub and refurbishing broadcasting house. I have written today to the Director General. This is vital investment. Will she join with me in urging the BBC to make sure it proceeds? I am always looking uh, for opportunities for investment um, in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and I will, of course, uh, ask my officials to come back to you uh, and talk to you about this particular project and see how we can help uh, in ensuring that this type of investment uh, goes forward. I call Mike Nesbitt. 55 minutes. I think there has been one very brief mention of the social economy. Would the Minister agree that does not do justice to that sector? And coming out of COVID, uh, that the social economy will be even more important than ever? Um, can I uh, thank you, the member, for his question? Social economy is incredibly important. It is a diverse uh, range uh, of businesses uh, within our economy. But most importantly, uh, some of the training providers who are part of that social economy um, and which my department funds and has continued to fund, uh, are able to bring people into the labour market, um, which, uh, who previously would have been very far distant uh, from that labour market. And I know that the member will know many examples uh, of that. So yes, it is an incredibly important part uh, of our economy. Um, they um, have been able uh, to access the furloughing scheme. Um, as I say, my department has continued uh, to pay those who are training providers, um, those training alliances uh, that we continue uh, that are there. Um, they are able uh, to uh, be part of the um, micro-business scheme. Um, and of course, um, should there be any other opportunities to support the, uh, the sector, we will of course look to that. 
call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for, for those words. In terms of the micro scheme, the micro fund uh, available to social enterprises with nine or fewer employees, is she aware that the criterion that you had to be a social enterprise without charitable status has knocked out a huge number of these organisations? And can she rectify that situation? Um, of course, um, there are many social enterprises uh, who uh, do not use charitable status, and they, of course, are uh, willing uh, and have applied uh, to any or all of the schemes. Um, the, the Minister for Communities is currently about uh, to bring forward a scheme for the wider charity sector, um, and, of course, that will be open to the social enterprise sector. Members, we're just about halfway down the list. I'm looking for your continued assistance in asking concise questions and concise uh, answers from the Minister so everyone will be afforded an opportunity. I call David Hillage. Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for her attendance here today. She's answered quite a few questions which I would have been looking to ask, but uh, we would uh, all join with our concerns today about the, the situation in the, in the aerospace industry and the bad news at Thompson's and Bombardier. Unfortunately, there are quite a few thousand jobs throughout the wider sector of aerospace and, and there are quite a few companies. I think everybody's looking very nervously at that sector today. Has there been any wider engagement, Minister, at this stage? Well, as I have said in answer to previous questions, um, I am not just concerned about the larger aerospace companies, and of course we are very concerned about them. Uh, some of them um, are our flagship companies for Northern Ireland um, and are recognisable across the world uh, for the product, the skill, uh, the craftsmanship uh, of what they've produced. Um, but I am equally concerned for those smaller manufacturers who are part of the supply chain into uh, the wider aerospace industry. I recognise that many of these are small businesses who rely on those supply chain into um, the, the wider and, and larger uh, sect sector. Um, so yes, I am, and they will be part of our discussions on how to maintain the supply chain or diversify the supply chain going forward. Call David Hillage for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, another sector that has been uh, raised recently, particularly with the First Minister yesterday, and not directly, obviously, maybe yourself, but uh, will the Minister be working with executive colleagues to provide support uh, for uh, further initiatives in childcare as we move forward? Because that's equally as important to try and to come out of the economy as well. Um, we have just spent a very long time on this particular issue. Um, at the executive meeting this morning. Um, we need um, to get back to some kind of semblance of normality um, on the childcare issue. Issues like social distancing impact on the provision of childcare. Um, issues like um, people um, getting back to work. Um, we, we cannot get our economy up and running if we are not providing people um, with adequate and appropriate opportunities to have their children looked after safely and appropriately as we go forward. So this is a hugely important area um, that we look at. As we travel forward in reopening the economy, we will need to, to balance all of those competing needs um, together so that we're trying to have some semblance of, of a, a roadmap that helps everything to converge a, at the right time. Childcare is one of those. Opening up education, allowing our young people to get back to school is another one of those issues that we will have to look at uh, very carefully. I call Cahill Boylan. Last one, Colonel August Coram Falter. River Atchis and Ira, and could I welcome the Minister's statement? And I'm glad to hear the Minister mention the issue of working from home and online, but could I ask the Minister, um, she's well aware that Project Stratum is going to be a major project, could I ask her just for a wee update on that, and is that project going to prioritise those not spot areas and the areas with poor broadband, who people have experienced over this COVID period, trying to work from home and everything else? Could you give us a wee update, please? Um, I thank the member for his question. I think that this is really, really uh, an, a very, very important area. Um, 
I was speaking to one of our flagship tech companies yesterday. They're planning to work from home for the rest of this year for most of their staff. Um, they see that as being the most efficient in, in terms of what they do and in keeping their staff safe from the virus. Of course, things will change as, as the economy opens up and, and please, um, um, if, if we can stay safe and control uh, the transmission of the virus. So working from home is going to be part of the future programme for work in Northern Ireland and indeed throughout the world. I think that we will probably not do things in the same way as we have done heretofore. So it is therefore really, really important um, that we focus uh, on how to connect people through good uh, broadband. Project Stratum uh, is now um, at the procurement stage. I hope um, that uh, the, the assessment of the bids that have come in uh, will um, be uh, available and we will be able to um, announce uh, how to take it forward uh, by September. Um, that will uh, give us £165 million uh, to invest in uh, connectivity right throughout Northern Ireland. Currently, um, there are around about 80,000 properties in Northern Ireland uh, that have broadband speeds that would need the intervention of, of uh, Project Stratum. And 97% of those are in rural areas or areas with less than 1,000 houses. So I see this not just as an important connectivity project, but really important in levelling up economic opportunity right across Northern Ireland. Last Congress, and could I welcome the Minister's comments? But Minister, just in the interim period, because I know and many other members probably were contacted, there's ongoing BT engineering works on all the providers, and people are sitting in their homes watching down the road where people are getting connected 100 metres away. So they're frustrated that they're sitting there and don't have broadband. Could, could I ask the Minister to give a commitment to engage with providers so that when they're on the ground to look to see if they can facilitate those people where possible um, to, for a uh, better broadband provision. Um, there are a range of uh, initiatives that are currently available, community initiatives and different types of initiatives that are currently available to help to upgrade band, broadband uh, for individuals and indeed for small community areas. And I, I know that some small uh, rural areas that have taken advantage of this, and I will ask my officials to write to you after uh, this debate um, and give you the list of those types of initiatives um, that you might want to pass on to your constituents. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I raised this question on Tuesday with the Health Minister and he batted me over to you, so I'm going to have a go at this now. It's about um, allied health professionals, uh, businesses and independent practice. Uh, they provide a very valuable role and particularly will be in the future in terms of supporting people. And it's what financial assistance you'll be able to give to them because a lot of them have missed out on the grant support. So it's the actual grant support and also the ongoing operating costs because they're not going to be able to operate the model they did in the past. Um, I recognise uh, the issue um, and I hate to tell the Health Minister but I am writing to him again because I think that he needs to plot a course for the reopening of health, the allied health professionals. So um, for those uh, who go to physiotherapy um, or wherever they go um, they, to, to have uh, these things sorted out, I think that we now need to pursue a strategy that allows these people to get back to opening up safely uh, and in line with their professional body's advice. So I am, of course, um, going to, uh, in the process uh, of writing to the Health Minister about this issue, because I think that that is the most important thing that we can do. Um, physiotherapists are not just for hospitals. Many of them operate in our communities and they pick up services that uh, hospitals, because of long waiting lists, etc., just simply can't, can't get to. So we need to work with them, with their professional bodies, to make sure that they can open again safely. Many uh, of those people have been able to uh, avail of uh, the 10K grant. Uh, and if they employ people uh, within 
uh, can avail of the micro business grant uh, as well. They all tend to be fall into that category. Um, but the greatest help that we can now give them is direction, guidance, and help to open safely. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. But I urge that you try to come together and get a solution around that, particularly around the ongoing operating costs. I'm regularly at a physio because of my running injury, so it's uh, self-inflicted. Uh, just one other thing. Uh, in relation to the 10K and 25K schemes, they closed a while ago. What was, the, was there any underspend in that? And can that be used to help those that have been excluded from assistance, such as, for example, bed and breakfasts who are paying uh, domestic rates, or businesses who uh, have multiple properties but only got one grant? As I've said before, um, the schemes uh, and the funding for those schemes are held centrally. Um, as part of the COVID funds. Um, we will be putting up a paper to the executive, um, giving the, the, uh, the detailed figures on, on how those schemes, how much they've spent, um, and where there are underspends, um, and the executive will then take a decision uh, as to what to do with that uh, further funding. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, last can call you, uh, and I thank the Minister for her statement. And, and she has mentioned a few times so far the Tourism Recovery Steering Group uh, that she chairs and the, the, the engagement that it's doing to plan for a new recovery. Given that I represent North Antrim, a constituency heavily reliant on the tourism uh, uh, sector, can I ask the Minister uh, maybe for a few more details about the type of issues uh, that the, the recovery group is doing and when it intends to report? Um, can I thank the member for his question? I um, had a Zoom call uh, last Friday with many um, tourist businesses, uh, including hotels uh, within your constituency. Um, and of course, the work of the Tourism Recovery Group has been focused on how to get tourism back up and running again. The first um, product, if you want, or report of that group will, of course, be the guidance that will be offered uh, to hotels uh, and the wider tourism and hospitality sector on reopening. Um, I hope that they will report with that next week and we will publish it as soon as we can thereafter. Call Philip McGuigan for supplementary. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for your answer, Minister. And obviously, there will be short term challenges from within the tourism sector as it, as it plans its recovery. You, you mentioned marketing earlier on. I mean, does the Minister agree with me that Tourism Ireland is key uh, as we try to recover from, from this pandemic? And that she talked about uh, engagement with American tourists. When people travel to this island, they don't recognise uh, borders or separate jurisdictions. Uh, they, re they recognise a simple island and travel from one part to the next, and that Tourism Ireland is key uh, in marketing that. Well, of course, I would have no desire to make tourism into any uh, political uh, agenda, uh, and I think the member should reflect on that. Um, I um, regularly speak uh, to the Chief Executive of Tourism Ireland because he is charged and paid by the executive uh, to market Northern Ireland, for example, in Great Britain. So just the other day, I was talking to him about a marketing campaign that Tourism Ireland should be carrying out for the benefit of Northern Ireland in Great Britain. I didn't design these structures, and I would have designed them differently had uh, I been uh, uh, allowed to do so. But we are where we are. And that is where uh, his responsibility lies. The responsibility for marketing Northern Ireland uh, in, uh, on the island of Ireland is, of course, uh, a matter for Tourism Northern Ireland. Um, and I, of course, have been uh, talking to them about marketing campaigns that we can use um, for uh, the immediate future. In uh, the wider range uh, of, of issues around tourism, um, I think uh, we should also reflect that much of our international tourist visitors um, feel um, unprepared, unsafe, and, and people are, are really unwilling to travel. And that is why I was engaging through Tourism Ireland uh, with the North American tour operators, many of whom uh, bring tours into Northern Ireland, where those are around uh, worship and churches, 
to golf, to, to, to history and, and many other things. And I will continue to do that because I think that we can uh, see growth in the North American market uh, on many sectors, um, not least uh, that Ulster Scots element of our heritage, which is also very important in Northern Ireland. I call Justin McNulty. Um, following on from my colleague's statement on tourism, I, I note the Minister's work on reopening the tourism industry. And the 20th of July date on reopening hotels, caravan sites, guest houses, and B&Bs. Given the Taoiseach's announcement that the same sectors will open in the south on the 29th of June, and given your comments around unwillingness to travel for international tourists, should we be trying to avoid an even greater exodus in the month of July than normal, and trying to invite some people from the south to the north to avail of our tourism, our tourism, our tourism offerings up here? Thank you, Minister. Um, can I thank the member uh, again for his question? Um, I think that what we need to do, and what the executive has been focused on doing, um, and what I have been focused on doing as the Minister for Tour Tourism, is what is right for Northern Ireland. And part of that will bring us into line with what's happening in the wider uh, British Isles. So, um, over the, you're quite right to say I, I was very busily engaged with the sector and with the executive in trying to get a date for the opening of hotels, uh, which was around the 20th of July. I am preparing a separate and, and another paper uh, for um, the executive, where I hope that they will reconsider that date, um, not just for hotels, but just for the wider tourism and hospitality sector, uh, and indeed a separate date uh, for that uh, self uh, catering or uh, caravan sector. These are all really important issues. I do not want our industry here to be uncompetitive or at a competitive disadvantage compared to other parts of the British Isles. And I will do whatever I can to make sure that that is understood and that we are able to operate uh, safely and open uh, as soon as is practicable. Call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I note uh, you, you mentioned that the executive were meeting today or did meet today. Did you make a recommendation on the reopening of shopping centres like the Butter Crane or the Keys in Yerry or the Miles Shopping Centre in Armagh? Member, I'll be really pleased to know that that was one of the items that the executive agreed today. So the wider shopping, all of retail, will be open. I call Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Minister, for your statement today. And on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party, we too express our concerns about the aerospace industry and the loss of jobs. But I would also like to welcome your forming of an economic advisory group. And again, Alvina Graham, who has done much very positive work for Northern Ireland. But the question I have is how can an economic advisory group work effectively if we do not have a fiscal council or a fiscal commission, which has been most much promised but much delayed? Well, uh, of course, the issue uh, for the Fiscal Council is uh, an NDNA uh, commitment. Um, in my role as the Minister for the Economy, I am doing what I am responsible for, uh, and that is forming an economic advisory group. I hope to announce the names of those individuals that will form that group. Um, and we want to look at a future economic strategy for Northern Ireland. Um, and that future economic strategy should support those industries that are part of our core and our fabric, so our agri-food industry, our tourism industry, those things that are absolutely core to Northern Ireland, but should look for new opportunities to develop uh, Northern Ireland in, in, into not just new markets, but into uh, new sectors. So I mentioned earlier today cyber security. I think that our tech sector, um, and I think that uh, we will have an opportunity for some of the really innovative work that is happening uh, within um, our uh, energy and clean green energy sector uh, to bring forward some uh, really good proposals. It's a really good time to establish the economic advisory or re-establish it again. And I hope to connect it to that East Coast advisory group uh, that I reformed when I was in uh, the States in March. 
They're a group of individuals who all come from Northern Ireland who have done really well um, in their careers and lives in the east coast of America, but who want to give back to Northern Ireland. And we want to harness and utilise their energy uh, in trying to promote, not just promote Northern Ireland, but actually bring foreign direct investment jobs and better jobs to Northern Ireland. And if I may be permitted, Mr Speaker, because something I'm quite passionate about, I want to set the direction on this before this assembly finishes, um, and your cooperation and help uh, and, and, and conversations around this are really important, um, that we also um, try um, uh, and get our industry working really well alongside our universities so that research and innovation is key. Um, to where uh, we actually uh, pitch uh, our economy in the long term. Um, I was speaking to the Chief Executive of Sigeland, um, who are bringing 65 cybersecurity uh, jobs uh, to Northern Ireland. It's a Boston-based company. Um, and even in the midst of our pandemic, he was saying, you know, um, I, I'm investing in Northern Ireland. I see great opportunities in Northern Ireland. But primarily, why? because we had that MA in cybersecurity and that our industry and our university were working hand in hand. So it's really important. Thank you. Sorry. Call Steve Aiken for supplementary. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. And indeed, may I, having met the East Coast Group many times and extol the virtues of Northern Ireland, I think it's an excellent place. But my supplementary question is, at the present moment in time when there are so many different innovative ways of gathering funding, can you ask the Economic Advisory Group, and also the Fiscal Council if we ever see it, to start looking at a national recovery fund, something that will enable a Northern Ireland to pull itself out of COVID and prepare itself for next year and for the rest of our second century, because we've been successful so far during the first century, and we really look forward to our second century. But let's do it with a strong economy. I absolutely concur uh, with the member um, I want Northern Ireland to be well placed for its second century. I think that that is hugely important. And of course, I will work um, with uh, whoever uh, to try to make sure that that is the case. For now, I am focusing on the Economic Advisory Group, getting it up and running. My department will service it uh, with uh, papers and, 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 and the things that it needs to do. Um, but we really want it to be uh, there for ideas, for discussion, and to use and harness the skills of those people on that group who are already very, very successful in their own right to drive our economy forward. And of course, that supports locally jobs and families, and that's very important. Again, I would encourage both questioner and answers to be concise so everyone can be afforded a question. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for being here today and answering the questions thus far. Uh, Minister, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me that, the, that hospitality will be the sector most severely impacted as a consequence of this pandemic that we have faced, uh, and uh, that many uh, restaurant owners, cafe owners, and pub owners are very concerned about the uncertainty around the date for reopening. Can you provide some clarity to this House, Minister, as to the discussions you've had about the reopening of those premises and, and when that will take place? I thank the member for his question. I can confirm, and I think that most members of this House will acknowledge that I have had dis extensive discussions with the hospitality and tourism sectors. Um, I hope to be able to bring forward a paper to the executive at the start of the week, um, and hopefully we will be able to give the clarity that is needed. I call Daniel McCrossan for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer to that question. Uh, Minister, as you will be aware, the Irish Government have announced dates for the end of this month and the beginning of July for the reopening of such premises. This for a town like Straban or even the city of Derry or Oma will come as great concern because pubs just the distance from this chamber to the one across that hallway will be opened and the ones in Straban will be closed, and the same for restaurants and cafes. Minister, would you reconsider the date to come into line? with that announcement for the economic interest of all of us right across this island, north and south. And that's not a political point. It's a very clear one. And if you're not the going the to do that, Minister, will question. you consider further intervention the for the hospitality sector? Um, of course, uh, it is not for me alone uh, to make the decision in relation to the dates. 
Um, the executive, on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer, will take that decision. However, the member makes my argument for me. I agree. I call Pat Cackney. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy, uh, Deputy Speaker. Sorry. Uh, I'm up and down here. I don't know what's happening with me. I've been waiting outside there. And, and can minister, you be concise? I apologise to you. Can yeah. you be concise? Minister, I apologise if, if this question has already been there because I've seemed to have missed it uh, going on. But, um, Minister, has the Minister considered a support package for sole traders and single person businesses who have not been able to access any of the current support programmes and have had no income for 12 weeks? Um, I, of course, have uh, already indicated uh, that any funding that is available after the current grant schemes have finished and are uh, all uh, finalised uh, will uh, be made available back to the executive who will make a decision on uh, what further mitigations are necessary. Call Pat Cackney for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. In line with what everyone else has said, they're just about the hospitality sector, the special public house sector. Uh, they find themselves locked into a situation here at the moment that they have unfair competition and nothing will destroy their businesses like unfair competition. In my own family, my sister has a debt of £85,000 on a business which she never had before. So how, we need to get these businesses open. And what is the Minister doing in order to level the playing field here in Northern Ireland for a small uh, entrepreneur and publicans? Um, can I say um, I, of course, uh, agree that we need uh, to get uh, the businesses open. Uh, we, of course, need to get the wider economy open and business back once again doing business. Um, and I think I said this in response uh, to questions earlier in the week uh, in this House. So it's very important that as a whole that we get our wider economy opened. As I have said, I've had extensive uh, connections with the wider tourism hospitality uh, industry uh, and I will of course be providing further information to the executive next week. Call Rachel Woods. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for her statement to particularly uh, welcome the mention of the word green in terms of recovery. Let's hope that this is followed by suitable action by the executive. With regard to the statement and also in the charting a course for the economy document, the Minister says her department will provide forward guidance to businesses and employees to reduce uncertain, uncertainty and facilitate planning. So can I ask the Minister, with more businesses due to reopen tomorrow, has specific guidance been published and when will it be provided to all businesses and sectors so that they can reopen safely in order to protect both staff and customers? Um, can I thank uh, the member for a question? I am, of course, interested in clean green recovery um, and uh, recognise um, that uh, technology um, in improving and sustaining our climate um, has uh, benefited and uh, resulted in significant jobs in Northern Ireland. I am very confident that the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit of uh, Northern Ireland uh, will also uh, lead us further in this direction as well. In relation to the advice for businesses, just this week uh, my department uh, uh, provided updated guidance uh, on uh, the, the NI Business uh, Info website. This guidance uh, was uh, the result of uh, documents on working safely which came to us uh, from uh, our national government in London. That uh, guidance was looked at uh, by uh, the Engagement Forum, which of course is a compilation of business organisations uh, and unions who have come together for uh, the common good in this very difficult set of circumstances um, and was amended uh, to make it more Northern Ireland specific. So uh, it is now available uh, on the NI Business uh, Info website. Uh, and provides further clarification uh, for businesses as we go forward. In relation to tourism and hospitality, uh, the Tourism uh, Steering Group has been looking uh, at guidance uh, on that, and we will publish that in due course as well, but in plenty of time for the reopening of the sector. I call Rachel Woods for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask just who is responsible for ensuring that the public health measures are followed in places where relaxation is allowed? 
Um, the, uh, if you mean by that uh, the, the policing uh, of these areas, um, there will be a combination uh, of uh, areas of responsibility. So, of course, the Public Health Agency will give guidance uh, and, and support uh, the Health and Safety Executive where uh, there is uh, an issue over safety. Um, and, of course, on the wider front, some of our local councils will have statutory um, duties in relation to food safety, etc. as well. There will be a very wide range of people who have responsibility in this area. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have heard many comforting platitudes about the haulage sector, and yet here we are. Even though there was £59.5 million, pounds, the Finance Minister told us, at the centre, which came to us as a Barna consequential for transportation, here we are, and he tells us there hasn't been a single application, a single bid from the economy the minister or the infrastructure minister for the haulage sector. What's the point of platitudes if there's no bid? And in the same vein, could you tell us why? A request that I made to her private office as an MLA on the 27th of May, over two weeks ago, for a Zoom or conference Can call. Can the member finalise this question? for a Zoom or conference call with representatives from the industry hasn't even been acknowledged. Why is that? Um, I, I um, have to say that's uh, absolutely the first time I have heard of a request for a conference call. So I will, of course, take that back to the department this afternoon, um, and I will make sure that that uh, response is issued. Can I say that at the start of um, our, in March, April, um, we had extensive discussions with the Department for Transport around uh, help for the haulage industry. And I recognise and have worked with many of our haulage companies in trying to alleviate specific difficulties um, that they have had. The Department of Transport put forward a package or proposals uh, to Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, which were not um, then uh, looked at. Um, and since then, we have had a group uh, looking at, along with the Road Haulage Association and the Freight mm -hmm. Association, uh, of the difficulties uh, within the sector. Currently, we understand that uh, about 80% of the sector is operating normally, but that still leaves a significant 20% uh, that is in significant difficulties. Um, so we are continuing to work at this particular issue, and I will, of course, revert to the member in due course about his request. Could you master for supplementary? The point, of course, Minister, was there was a pot of money in finance and no bid to use it. Um, but having vented my frustration with the Department, could I be more encouraging to the Minister on the next point? Uh, I do welcome the fact that can, she can has... Can we have a question? I will. Uh, and Deputy Speaker, I'm not a second-class member of this House. Order Member. We're in trying to ensure that all members have an opportunity for questions. I have been generous with many in their introductions, and when I ask members to come to a question, I expect them to do so. I will afford you another opportunity. Mr. Alistair. In embracing the logic of moving from two metres to one metre, as has happened successfully in Denmark, in France, in highly populated places like Singapore and Hong Kong, I assume the Minister has medical backing for that sensible proposal. So why is there feet dragging in the executive about it? Because without it, as she says herself, we'll never open the economy and we'll never open our schools. Um, I, of course, appreciate uh, the member's sentiment uh, around this issue. Um, this is an issue um, that will not go away. That is something that we will have to address. The World Health Organization um, has indicated that uh, one metre is a, a, a suitable, sensible uh, distance. Um, but these are the balance, the very, very large balances 
that the executive as a whole has to weigh up as we try to plot our way forward um, and to open up the economy. And those have to be balanced as by the public health risks. And I absolutely make it clear that I will take the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer, people who have worked very hard to keep Northern Ireland safe during these very, very difficult circumstances. So while uh, we have that open and honest debate, while I can say to you quite genuinely that to open the economy successfully, we uh, need to review this particular issue. To get our schools back and running, we need to review this particular issue. Um, we will have to balance that with the transmission rate of the virus and the safety and health of people here in Northern Ireland. And that will always come first. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, there is a particular problem related to guest houses um, in that the vehicles um, in which the executive you have used to provide financial support have excluded those who do not uh, pay non-domestic rates. Um, People who own guest houses wouldn't typically employ staff, or, nor would they um, even pay uh, business rates because it is their home, it's their domestic property. Um, and you know, I, I really do appreciate the Minister's commitment around trying to support tourism within Northern Ireland, but particularly in the North Coast where we have a deficit of four-star luxury accommodation. Can we come to the question? Guest houses um, do supplement that. And I do think that when we, when we move into the recovery phase, they're going to continue to have difficulties and they need that ongoing financial support. So can I ask the Minister um, if she will put focus on trying to support guest houses? Um, the member makes a really valid point. Um, the tourism offering in Northern Ireland isn't just about the five-star hotels, um, important as they are, or even the medium-sized hotels, but many people who visit the North Coast, uh, who go to Fermanagh, who go across Northern Ireland, uh, find themselves in really, really good accommodation uh, in local uh, guest houses and B&Bs. And it is something uh, that is on my mind. And of course, as I have indicated, as we go forward, I will be bringing a paper around the options uh, for further support. I call Claire Sutton for a supplement. Thank you. Um, I've received responses from both the Finance Minister and the Economy Minister in relation to accessing other supports, including the Hardship Fund. The difficulty is for these particular guest houses, they can't because to be able to access it, they have to have employees, which I've stated they don't typically have. Um, the other difficulty is, as well, is that the extension of the 12 months. Can we have a question, or we will move on? Business rate relief does not include those individuals either. Is there an opportunity to work with the finance minister to try and ensure that those businesses who don't pay, non, uh, who, who pay domestic rates, could have access to a rate relief for the remainder of the financial year? It is, of course, uh, a matter for the finance minister. Um, and as to how that is particularly set up, uh, and I'm sure it's something that you have made uh, representation to the Finance Minister on, um, and which my officials can, of course, pass on to him following this debate. I call Jerry Carl. There's been much talk about the new normal, and we were led to believe that lessons have been learned from previous crises, but it seems that the bosses at Bombardier, who are cutting hundreds of jobs, and management at Debenhams, who look to follow suit, haven't got the memo. In relation to the advisory group, can I ask the Minister, is it now time for a totally new economic strategy that puts workers first and not one that leaves the destinies of so many in the hands of so few? I thank the member uh, for his question uh, and for his concern uh, for the workers at Bombardier. It's very, very uh, important uh, that we provide support and help going forward. Um, I am, of course, uh, keen to develop a new economic strategy uh, for Northern Ireland, one that does uh, put workers at uh, the heart of it, but one where workers will have jobs, where businesses will be able to flourish, uh, and where we allow uh, those who can provide and support communities uh, to get on with the job uh, of doing it. The entrepreneurs, the businesses uh, in our society support many families across Northern Ireland, and we need to support them too. I thank the Minister for her uh, answer. Uh, would the Minister advise all those people starting back to work tomorrow, especially those in retail who are not in a trade union, to join one to protect themselves and their health and safety at work? That, of course, is a matter for individual choice. Are there any other members who have yet to ask the question? 
I call Colin McGrath. No, thank you very much. Um, Minister, in reference to the uh, B&B scheme, there is a successful scheme in Scotland which might be worth uh, looking at to provide support for that sector. But in terms of, I want to ask a question about outdoor uh, markets, which if they are clear cut because they are outside maybe in town centres or in open spaces or grand, but if they're, you must enter through a building to get to an outside space where it is. I have a social enterprise group in my constituency that helps to fund uh, the work that they do. It is within a council building. Would you be advising councils that they should facilitate social enterprises for work that is permitted under other schemes, such as outdoor markets? Well, of course, I can't comment on the specifics of it, but if you want to write to me, of course, I'd be very happy to, d to do that, um, or, or we can have a, a conversation about it at a later stage. Um, and I would and encourage all councils to work uh, with businesses, um, social enterprise and the wider range of businesses to ensure that what we are doing is opening up our economy safely uh, in the days ahead in a way that boosts uh, and creates jobs, supports families and keeps people safe. Call Colin okay. 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 <coughs> Members, that concludes questions on the same point of order. Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that other members of this House will feel the same frustrations I do. I travel, travel two hours to this chamber to represent my constituents, and to be interrupted mid-question is entirely inappropriate. And also, Mr Deputy Speaker, to sit like this here behind that podium is not appropriate. Order. It needs to be reviewed. Order. If the member has any concerns, he should speak to the Speaker's office. I, in my role as Acting Deputy Speaker here, endeavour to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to ask their question, and indeed questions. And in, to enable me to do that, I have sought assistance from members to be concise in their introductions. And when I felt, felt people have went over that, I have drawn attention to that fact and sought their cooperation. And if the member wishes to ensure that he, he does get two questions in the future, he should, and all members should remember that. And it is also important not to challenge the chair. Moving on, that concludes questions on the statement. Item number three is the time, date and place of our next meeting. And we have yet to receive uh, confirmation from the Executive Phone Ministers. We will next come to make statements to the committee. And as soon as confirmation has been received, notification will be forwarded to members in the normal fashion. I remind members that the next scheduled setting of the plenary of the, set of the Assembly is scheduled to take place on Tuesday the 16th of June and that members, ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days, perhaps with shorter notice. That includes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern